this down to lay business person's terms for us. What does this mean if you're a business who uses your suite? What, what I think is important to start with is what happens with the typical cloud infrastructure. So if you are summoning a car service or ordering something from your favorite e-commerce site, even if that service or e-commerce site is using the cloud, that data is going back to one location in the world. And by and large, that's going back to somewhere like Ashburn, Virginia, or, uh, or the Dales in Oregon, or a very limited set of where data is stored. And what is happening is that consumers are getting fed up and governments are getting fed up with all of that data getting sent back to these limited set of regions around the world. And so they've passed rules that say, if you're a business going forward, you need to store the data of your customers in the jurisdictions where those customers live and work and reside and use your service. And you can't transfer it back to Ashburn, Virginia. And the problem is that that creates a real challenge for businesses because up until now, there hasn't been a cloud that allowed you to do that. And so what we are launching with the data localization suite is a way to use Cloudflare's network and keep the data of your customers in the regions where those customers live in order to comply with it, what is a increasingly complicated set of regulations around the world. So will this change, you know, data is a business practices or how I experience my favorite businesses products? Well, I think that what you're seeing from businesses themselves is that they have a lot of pressure from regulators. And we saw this with TikTok, which had pressure from uh, the Trump administration to keep data about US citizens in the United States. We saw this with Facebook, which has said that they will actually pull out of Europe if they, can, if they have to not send data about European citizens back to the United States. And so over time, what we believe is that the businesses that are going to best comply with these increasing regulations are going to use a service like Cloudflare in order to make sure that their consumers still get a great experience. They can still get the efficiencies of the cloud, but they can comply with what are these increasingly complicated data localizations and data sovereignty regulations all around the world. How does GDPR and potentially incoming privacy legislation in the United States impact this effort? So about 76% of countries around the world already have or are about to pass privacy regulations. Nearly two thirds of the world's population is already covered by some privacy regulations. So it's not just GDPR. The Singapore government, the Japanese government, the Brazilian government, the Indian government are all saying, you need to, as a business, store customers' data local within our jurisdiction and, and keep it there. And so that creates a real problem for businesses that are trying to be global. And we heard this from our customers over and over and over again. And so that's what inspired us in order to launch this product. Now, what does this mean for Cloudflare? Obviously, this is good business for you as well, but does it give you an edge that your competitors aren't offering? You know, I think that most of the traditional public clouds that you think of, the AWS's, the Microsoft Azure's, the Google Clouds, were built for a world where it was okay to send all that data back to some central location. And what we see from our customers is that they want to, again, comply with these increasingly complicated regulations. And because Cloudflare's network today already spans more than 100 countries around the world, we are in a unique position to help our customers and help businesses wherever they're operating, make sure that they can service their customers wherever those customers are. You're also getting a lot of data coming in about uh, Black Friday, Cyber Monday, how folks have been uh, shopping over the last few weeks. You, you've seen that Cyber Monday was in fact bigger than Black Friday. Talk to us about the trends and how they might be different this year compared to last. You know, traditionally, the sort of general thought was that Cyber Monday was when people went back to work and they and they sat down during their lunch break and they bought things on, on e-commerce sites, whereas Black Friday was where we all went out and stood in line to, to go to the Walmart or Target uh, to buy whatever the latest deals are. And so we actually anticipated that that wouldn't change all that much this year, but it was surprising that this year we actually saw less e-commerce shopping on Black Friday and more on Cyber Monday, whereas in previous years, Black Friday has really dominated Cyber Monday. And so we're seeing the shopping season shift much more, we think, towards e-commerce and that e-commerce season be spread out over a longer period of time. All of last week was just a record-breaking amount of e-commerce traffic from everything that we could see across our network. Now, 
in your view, is this year just going to be an odd year or are these trends here to stay? Will next year, this time, look similar to this year given new habits that are being formed? You know, it's really hard to say um, what what what's going to happen when we when we go when we go back. I, I I'm looking forward to shopping in person, uh, whereas I, I in the past have been a, a very much an e-commerce shopper myself. Uh, but you know, I think that now that consumers have learned that they can get groceries online, that they can get uh, holiday gifts online, uh, that that is putting a lot of additional uh, load on the networks to make sure that they can accommodate that. And at Cloudflare. We're making sure that our systems are standing by and ready to stand up to whatever this Christmas holiday uh, brings. Now, what are you, uh, Matthew, as a business leader, how are you planning for 2021? You know, we're seeing this burst of IPOs at the end of the year, IPOs that are going to happen between Christmas and New Year's. Going into this pandemic, Sequoia, the venture capital firm, called COVID the black swan of 2020 and, you know, warned all of these businesses to lock down. But um, for so many tech companies, it's been a bigger year than ever. What? It, how are you preparing for next year? You know, I think it's been interesting to watch what's happened since the pandemic. So uh, the pandemic we really hit in in most of the world the very end of Q1. In Q2, uh, we saw definitely a harder time for for our sales teams to close new business, uh, but our ability to expand with our existing customers uh, was very very strong. Q3 saw new businesses starting to realize that. This transition that we've made towards remote work is here to stay, and so we actually feel like there's a there's a real strength in that transition. What what the pandemic has caused is not a radical rethink of how we work, but it's just accelerated trends that were already happening. And so we see strength uh, in in the core shift to the cloud for services that Cloudflare provides uh, going going into Q4 and into into next year. I think the main thing that we're thinking about is. How exactly do we think about coming back to work? By the time we get to July, when we think that our offices can be fully back open and people coming back in based on everything that we're seeing, more than half of Cloudflare employees will have never worked a single day in a Cloudflare office. 